asking everyone. Everyone ready to go or do we need a few more minutes to get ready? Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, for answering. Um, and Daniel. Let's get. Let's do it this way. So we last left off. Get this ready first. Okay. All right. So we last left off, I believe, on slide twenty nine of lecture three. Uh, yes. So thank you. Um, so today we'll get through the rest of lecture three, lecture four and five. And then I've got some questions um, for you. I have eight questions this time. Also, I have been in contact with Dr. Anderson and Dr. Bross about the lecture for tomorrow and the slides. Because it's probably probably some of you have noticed that slides aren't up yet. Um, and they're kind of having an issue with one of the lecturers um, and they're working on it to get these slides posted up. I think it might end up being Dr. Pross lecturing tomorrow as well. Um, and to my knowledge, she's going to get her slides up pretty soon, but bear with her because she doesn't normally teach the next lecture, so she's going to have to create her slides. Um, so it might be a little bit before she automatically gets them up, just so everyone knows. All right, so. Go ahead. Um, who usually lectures on Thursday? Um, so, so it's not necessarily Thursday, but lecture five. I'm sorry, lecture six is normally done by Dr. Yugen. He's uh, one of the virology teachers. Um, and he's not able to. Uh, he's not able to lecture for Thursday or next Tuesday, and he normally does those two. So they're going to have Dr. Pross do it, and she's going to have to kind of take his slides and then adjust the information, but she'll still be the one uh, creating the questions for the test. Thank you. No problem. All right, so where we left off, um, we did go over an antigen processing and presentation. This is something we talked about a lot in the second lecture and this lecture about how an APC or a cell of the innate immune system will uptake an antigen by phagocytosis, degrade it, by putting mixing the phagosome with the lysosome and then getting those uh, peptides or whatever um, piece they actually might need to create an antigen and then put it out onto the mhc complex and load it onto the outside of the cell and then the apc in this case uh, macrophage or dendritic cell will then use the mhc and present it to a cd4 or CD8 cell, depending on the type of antigen. So the types of antigens. Um, our first type, endogenous. We should know this. We've talked about this a lot. Um, endogenous just being within the cell, so created throughout the metabolism from within the cell, so viral or uh, intracellular bacteria or even cancer cells. And these are associated with MHC class 1 and CD8 cells. So like I said before, when you're creating your study sheet, Try to throw all of this information in when you're talking about the different types of uh, T cells, when you're talking about the different types of MHCs or HLAs, whichever, whichever term you want to use. Make sure that you know the difference between the endogenous and exogenous. So our exogenous, again, um, this one is done through APCs. Someone has their mic on. Hopefully they just turned it off. So odd sounds coming from them. Um, so our exogenous. So our exogenous is just when we have that extracellular bacteria or that extracellular antigen, and those are going to be processed on our MHC class 2, and as we know already, those go to the helper T cells. So the main idea between the endogenous pathway with the endogenous pathway, like we said, it's going to be a, um, a virus or intracellular bacteria or tumor cell making an endogenous antigen. That antigen will be presented on class 1 MHC, and then we're going to see interaction between TAP and tapasin on how we actually get that antigen from within the cell 
out onto our class one MHC molecule. And we'll go through that in a little bit. She has those diagrams or those pictures. The endogenous is a little different. The endogenous, or I'm sorry, the endogenous uh, being the cytosolic, um, this is the entire pathway here. So this entire pathway explains every single step. You don't need to know every step. Um, you also don't need to know every detail of the pathway. What you do need to know is the main players. So like we said before, TAP and Tapasin. And there's a really good picture on the next slide uh, that explains or that shows the pathway. Here, we're just going to go from the antigen being endogenously processed. So the antigen is going to be released from the virus or the, um, the nucleus of the tumor cell. And then the proteins are going to be unfolded. We're going to degrade the antigen within the proteasome. And then once it's degraded into these peptides, the peptides are transported by TAP. So the first interaction with those antigen peptides is going to be TAP, and it's going to be transporting it into the endoplasmic reticulum. From there, we're going to synthesize class 1 MHC. So class 1 MHC is not always expressed on the cell. It is synthesized from the endoplasmic reticulum. And then once it's synthesized, then we attach TAP. I'm sorry, we attach um, TPA, which is a linker that connects to PACIN. So we've gotten the actual antigen within the cell. Once we have that antigen within the cell, that it's been processed in the cell, TAP attaches onto that onto those peptides that have been degraded, takes it over to the ER. The ER is then going to create our class one MHC, and then we're going to have a transport of the class one MHC and the degraded peptides through to Pacin. To Pacin will then transport it to the actual cell surface and then express that MHC class one and then MHC class one interacts with the CD8 T cells. So it is a slightly confusing because it uses a lot of the similar names. Um, make sure you really know TAP and to Pacin interact to put the MHC class one on the cell surface. So here we have a diagram showing us this whole process. So we have here um, the virus. The virus will take over the host's machinery to create its own viral particles. Some of those particles will then be broken up here in the proteasome. And then we'll see these little peptides. The peptides get gathered by TAP, get put into the endoplasmic reticulum. Here we actually create in the endoplasmic reticulum, we're creating that class one MHC. Then it is transported. The, excuse me, the TAP and the MHC class one are then transported through to Payson all the way to the front of the cell on the outside. Now, hell, I'm having trouble remembering all the abbreviations. Yeah, TPA is a typo on uh, Dr. Pross's um, slides. It is just supposed to be TAP. Thank you all for helping correct that and staying on the chat. Uh, so like I said, um, Make sure you know the process. Our two big players here, TAP and Tapasin. Um, it's also important to note that the class one MHC is made in the endoplasmic reticulum before it is then expressed on the cell surface. So no TAP to Payson, know that MHC class one is made in the ER and then all expressed on the surface. And then you should know that the endogenous pathway is uh, activating our CD8. So it's activating uh, cytotoxicity, so cell death. Um, so tapasin is actually just this little binder that connects TAP with the MHC. That is all it does. Um, so tapasin, it binds TAP to the MHC, allowing the protein or the peptide, so our little, our specific antigen, to go from TAP to the MHC. But tapasin, if you look really closely, um, this little bar here is tapasin. So tapasin literally just links TAP to the MHC. That is all it does. All right, so now the next pathway, the exogenous pathway. Remember when we were talking about these pathways, the things that distinguish them are the type of peptide and then which MHC is activated as well as what T cell is activated. So make sure you, you can just off the top of your head rattle it in conversation which endogenous does which, exogenous does which, 
you know, what causes each one, which MHC, which cells are being activated. So our exogenous, um, this is through extracellular antigens, like we said, mainly um, extracellular bacteria. We went through the process already that it gets phagocytized and then we break it up, release those peptides or those proteins, and then we get them on the MHC class two. The main important activators here are clip and invariant chain. So these carry on very similar roles to tap and to pace, and we'll see those as we go. So here's the entire process. Once again, we've talked about a good majority of this already. So uh, protein antigens are ingested by the APC. Remember, in this case, APCs for exogenous APCs are specifically dendritic cells and macrophage. Um, APC is just referring to an antigen presenting cell. So we have to make sure that we're differentiating APCs in endogenous versus APCs in exogenous. So they're digested. The class two molecules enter the same vesicles and the class two invariant chain and clip, um, which are usually in the cleft of the newly synthesized class two is removed. Once it's removed, that allows the binding of the new antigen peptide onto the class two, and then we'll transport it onto the cell surface and it'll interact with CD4. Once again, there's a beautiful picture on the next slide that shows everything in detail. So here we can see the, um, the endosome getting the protein antigen from extracellular goes in with the endosome and lysosome. We're going to break it down. When we break it down, we're going to meet it with another vesicle that has the MHC class two. Remember MHC class two already has the clip and, and the invariant chain within it. So once the clip and invariant chain come out, that gives us access to put the new antigen within the MHC class two. And then we take it to the outside of the cell and it's expressed on the cell and it can interact with CD4. Um, so slightly different than what we were talking about before. Invariant chain allows it to transport. So invariant chain is going to allow the MHC class 2 to transport from the endoplasmic reticulum into the vesicle. And then the clip is going to be the little piece that we have that kind of adds and transports the new antigen or peptide into the MHC class 2. So it's, it's similar to MHC class one with TAP and Topacin, but a little different. So remember TAP transported the peptides. Here, CLIP transports the peptides. Then invariant chain is what helps transport the MHC class two. Um, so it's slightly different, but make sure you just know invariant chain CLIP and then CD4. You don't need to know their exact mechanism you just need to be familiar with invariant chain and clip being exogenous, tap into pace and being endogenous. Hi, Daniel. Um, I thought she had said that clip was in the cleft of the MHC type two. Yes. Um, okay, so it, it clip is with the MHC, not the protein. I just wanted to clarify. So, okay, so what happens, and you can see in the picture, the invariant chain and clip are all part of the same molecule. So the invariant chain specific, so the clip gets into the MHC class two. The invariant chain is what allows it to transport into the vesicle. Then clip has to come out of the MHC class two. When it comes out, it releases an attractant for the antigen to go into the MHC class two. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, so, so clip is the, is the one that's going to attract the antigen. Um, it is within the MHC class two. It's part of invariant chain. And so that one's going to help attract the antigen. And the invariant chain is going to help transport the MHC class two into the vesicles. And that's as far as it goes. All right. Um, so this summary is fantastic. Um, it doesn't give you as much the detail of what they do. Um, but is, it is it kind of gives you an overview. This is somewhat similar to what your your study guide should look like this summary here. Um, you can also add other things, but it tells you the types of a the APCs, which cells respond, um, the sources of the antigens. So that is pretty important to know where each antigen is gonna come from in the class one and class two. It also tells you uh, the site of the peptide loading. You don't need to know that as much. Um, it is important to know that both of them come from the endoplasmic reticulum, that class one and class two. Both occur in endoplasmic reticulum. Loading in class one is in the ER, and then loading in class two is in a vesicle. 
it's important to know, but it's not. I can't see it being something that she's going to test on that harshly. And then once again, the exact same pictures, just zoomed in a little bit more and given to you both as summaries. So make sure you know these processes. Like I said, you don't have to know every single detail, but it pretty is important uh, to know which players are which and what their what their key is in the scenario. All right, so we'll move on to the next lecture. So lecture four. Can everyone see my slides for lecture four? Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, so just like she said yesterday, Dr. Frost said it, the, uh, the lecture objectives, um, I stressed it last time in our review, it is so important to know these lecture objectives. Make your study guides off of them. This is what they're going to be testing off of when it's time for them to make test questions. This is what they go to. Um, when it's time for me to make my practice questions, this is what I go to. Um, these are pretty general, so you're going to want to be able to extrapolate these and get as specific as you can when filling out information for the objectives or answering the objectives. Try to get as specific as you can because we kind of use these as a guideline when we're making the questions. Uh, once again, a little bit of review, adaptive immunity. She just talked about this. Uh, the entire first section of immuno is just talking about the different types of immunity. So you should know this by now. Um, T cells and B cells, what they recognize and the types of antigens or macromolecules they recognize. This is extremely important. This is important to know what types of molecules will elicit what response. So peptides, peptides specifically elicit T cell responses. So only T cell responses. So, and you'll get into this later when we talk about viruses, but when we're talking about viruses, we make certain viruses to elicit certain responses. So if we, if we have a virus, or I'm sorry, a vaccine, we're making the vaccines to elicit certain responses. If we have a vaccine that we use peptide fragments, then we know that vaccine will elicit a T cell T cell response. So it'll elicit a T cell dependent response. If we have a vaccine that has lipids or sugars, then it's going to only elicit a B cell response. Remember, when we're talking about that, the important difference is if we have T cell response, then we can do class switching, which means we can get different immunoglobulins. If we have a B cell response only, then we're only going to get IgM because we won't be able to initiate class switching. So that's important now to be able to distinguish these. It's also going to be important later in lecture seven. Where do we see these antigens? We've talked about uh, this a lot, that um, antigens or the microbes come in contact with either the skin, the GI, respiratory tract, uh, genital urinal, urinary, and blood. Um, how do we see actually see these antigens? We've talked about this as well, the APCs whether it be a macrophage or dendritic cell, will come in contact with it, it'll break it down, and then it'll take it to a, sec a secondary lymph or organ. Remember the secondary lymph organs, these are your lymph nodes, your spleen, your GALT, so your gut-associated lymphoid tissue, um, and our biggest example of that is going to be the Peyer's patches in the small intestine. So the lymphocytes, the B and T cells are waiting in those secondary lymphoid organs for this interaction, this is where they wait. So we don't really have too many B and T cells kind of roaming around in the blood. We do have a certain amount, but not that many. They mainly sit in the lymph nodes waiting to be presented with antigen. So our dendritic cells, this is going to be our main traveling APC. So this is the APC that for the most part presents. Um, our macrophage do present to T cells, but the largest role for presentation is going to come from dendritic cells. These are the ones that lay within connective tissue. When we come in contact with that antigen, they'll break them down and they'll travel all the way back to the lymph, the lymph nodes or the lymph tissue and present them. So these are going to be our main presenters. We have been saying this whole time that macrophage and dendritic cells both do it, but it's really the role of the dendritic cell mostly. Um, so the capture and distribution of the antigen, we've, we've seen this already, that it comes in contact. Uh, we have that exposure, it breaks it down, then it takes it to the lymph node and presents it in the lymph node. Same thing, uh, dendritic cells migrate to lymphatic vessels, so they're the ones that actually traverse through the vasculature and the, uh, the lymph vasculature to actually get to the lymph nodes. They do have an increase in MHC expression and an increase in co-stimulators. So remember, co-stimulators being CD28, or we're talking about CTLA-4, 
Uh, we're going to get into those a little bit more. She kind of mentioned those. We're going to get into a little more about which ones do what. So T cells can help B cells. We know that because T cells are important for class switching and to allow different isotypes of immunoglobulin. So here um, are three major APCs. So even though we said dendritic cells, these are the ones that mainly present. Um, we do have others. So our macrophage, we've talked about this, and our B cells, we've talked about that. So the B cells, we know are going to actually work with uh, TH cells, so helper, so CD4 cells. Um, and this is going to create our humoral immunity, so our antibody-based immunity. Macrophage, uh, they will help with antibody production and the cell-mediated immune, cell immune response. So they can do both. So macrophages are involved in both B cell and T cell responses. And then dendritic cells can present either to helper, so CD4 or CD8 T cells. We've seen this picture a million times. Um, it is important to know how accurate the presentation has to be and how formal the presentation has to be. So back to our types of antigens. We kind of talked about this on the last uh, lecture a little bit. So we have our endogenous being viruses, so MHC class 1 and CD8. At this point, if we're doing CD8 T cells, remember it's going to be a peptide. And then exogenous, MHC class 2, CD4 T cells. If it's T cells, remember it will be a peptide. So the only time we're activating T cells are going to be through a peptide. If it's not a peptide, if it's a protein, so a long protein, multiple peptides, or a lipid or nucleic acid or any other macromolecule, it's going to be a B cell response. So we went through this pretty much uh, already. So the exogenous antigen present, uh, presentation, class two, uh, invariant chain, clip, class two coming on the surface, and it's gonna activate CD4. Um, same thing, um, endogenous class one, class one being peptide fragments, viral infection, tumors, tap to pacin, and it's gonna be on the, it's gonna be then presented onto the surface to interact with CD8. All right, so now hopefully we can get into the actual talk here. Um, this cross presentation, she kind of mentioned it. It's, it's it shouldn't be as confusing um, as it appears. So cross presentation just being the extracellular antigen. What that means is if we have a virally infected cell, it has endogenous antigen that it's producing. So it has the viral particles from within the cell are being produced. If those viral particles leave the cell, it is now exogenous because it is outside the cell. That viral particle that is now outside the cell then gets picked up by a dendritic cell. And then that dendritic cell realizes this is actually a viral particle and it presents it on its MHC class one to a CD8 cell. So it's technically extracellular only because it is outside the cell, but it was originally created from within the cell. That's the only odd scenario that we have here. So it'll still initiate the entire endogenous pathway, but instead of the infected cell being the APC, a dendritic cell or macrophage will be the APC. Uh, so the importance being to that for viruses and tumor cells, also for vaccination. So we're gonna get into vaccination specifically in lecture seven. We're gonna talk about it a lot um, and the different types of vaccines. So we're gonna have to get back into it. So this will become important then. Right now it's just an overview and it's just to understand that we can activate the CD8 cells through not just the infected cell, but other APCs that can pick up the antigens from the infected cell. So same thing, this is the overview of cross-presentation. Um, so the dendritic cells scan the area. If they find external antigens that were processed from a endogenous source, then it can present it onto the MHC class one, which will activate CD8 in response to this antigen and then go through normal cytotoxic response. Uh, Daniel? Yes. So how do the dendritic cells actually like find the antigens in that area? Um, so these are gonna be things like PRRs or any of their, so they have certain receptors that find things that are not self. Um, so they're similar to the PRRs, but it's, they have multiple, multiple different CDs on their surface. So CDs just being um, uh, distributions of different protein receptors on the outside. So anytime we talk about like CD8, 
CD4, all these things. It's just a cluster of differentiation on the outside of a cell. Um, the dendritic cells have a wide variety of them that essentially as they go through and kind of swim through the periphery, they come in contact with different things. So they'll come in contact, grab onto it, see is this self, is this not self, is this something I need to grab and just take in? And if it's not, then they'll let it go, move on to the next one, grab the next one, move on, grab, move on and grab until they find something that they actually need to internalize and then put onto a receptor. All right. Thanks, man. No problem. Um, so wait, Daniel, quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So essentially, so even though that it was produced internally and then once it leaves, uh, once it leaves and now it's external, it's mm -hmm. processed as um, it's processed as on, on MHC1, like with CD8. Uh, almost yes. like it's internal okay. yes yeah yeah so and that's that's the one like confusing part to it but what you have to remember is the antigen originally was from a virus so our throughout the whole system and throughout the education of t-cells and learning of our immune system we know that for a virally infected cells most of the time antibodies won't work so we need direct apoptosis of that cell so because that dendritic cell recognizes that antigen and it'll recognize as this is from a viral particle this was created from within the cell then we need to initiate cd8 cells thank you no problem uh, so uh, uh what when a virus is presented normally as an endogenous antigen can we assume the virus is infected a dendritic cell and that's why it's being processed in endogenous um, so, okay, so for actually to answer both uh, Nahel and uh, Cameron's questions. So when a virus infects a cell and it creates endogenous antigen, that's just viral particles that it's making. So as we know, viruses come in, they infect the host, and then they take over the host machinery. When they take over the host machinery because they don't have that machinery themselves, they use the host machinery for replication. Some of those pieces of replication are our peptide antigens, and that's going to be our endogenous antigen. When it infects any cell, any cell can then register that antigen and put it on their MHC class one. So an APC for an endogenous antigen is any nucleated cell. So if we're saying that a virus is uh, presented normally as an endogenous antigen, it can infect any cell in your body that has a nucleus because it needs that nucleus to be able to use your uh, DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase to actually recreate itself. Does that answer both of y'all's questions? So the APCs for endogenous are all nucleated cells. And then as well, um, if a virus is infected, it doesn't necessarily have to be a dendritic cell. Yeah, so anything except for a red blood cell can be infected by a virus. Um, the virus won't have any need to infect the red blood cell because if it infects a red blood cell, there's no nuclear machinery inside a red blood cell. So it's not gonna, it's not beneficial to the virus. All right. All right, so our function of cross-presentation, like we said, so this is if we have a virally infected cell, that antigen from the virus comes out. And so once that antigen from the virus uh, or that peptide comes out of the virus infected cell, it's no longer in the cell. If it's just out and floating around, then a dendritic cell will pick it up. Once it picks it up, it will process it and realize, wow, this is virus. This is something that we need CD8 cells for. And then it will take that and present it to a CD8 cell. So the only difference between the regular CD8 and the cross presentation is in a regular CD8 endogenous pathway, the virally infected cell will present its antigen on its own MHC class one. And then the virally infected cell will communicate with a CD8 cell directly. In this scenario, instead of the virally infected cell presenting its own antigen on its MHC class one, it will release the antigen. So that way an APC, a dendritic cell or a macrophage, usually a dendritic cell, will pick up that antigen and then present that antigen to a CD8 cell in place of the virally infected cell. So in this case, when the dendritic cell presents that antigen, to the CD8 cell, it will communicate to the CD8 cell, it is not me that is infected, it is this other virally infected cell, and it will release chemokines for that virally, for that virally infected cell, so the CD8 cells know to go there, rather than attack the, the dendritic cell. This becomes most common when we talk about cancer. And when we talk about immunotherapy, this is essentially what they're trying to do with immunotherapy. This is what a lot of research is basing on around immunotherapy with this cross-presentation. 
And you'll see later when we talk about it, um, cancer cells will internalize the MHC system. So if you, if you are a cancer cell, if you're a tumor cell, it's a cell that genetically has gone wrong, then you have certain machinery inside so that you can't express an MHC. So you have the infection inside of you, you have this antigen, but you have no MHC to put it on. So instead what we're trying to do, or what a lot of researchers are trying to do, is force that antigen out of the tumor cell that is no longer expressing it to then activate this pathway. Does that make sense to everyone? And I just wanted to clarify the um, dendritic cell pre uh, presents via the MHC class one. Yes. And usually it would be an MHC class two. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Make sure. So we kind of talked about it before. Make sure you know the shape here. You should be able to tell from the picture here that this is an MHC class one because all of these are alpha chain. Because you can see this little orange chain is all connected to itself. That means it's an alpha chain. So that's going to be your MHC class one. This green receptor on the other side of the dendritic cell, that's going to be your MHC class two. So make sure you know those little pictures is something we talked about in the last review session. So cross presentation is very, very important, mainly for uh, tumor immunity. And it's something that you'll get into when they talk about how cancer cells can evade the immune system. Um, it's also used in vaccine um, creation, but not as much. Mainly it's what the, it's the big thing right now with immunotherapy with um, cancer treatment. There's our summary of cross presentation. Another summary. Remember the summaries are very important for Dr. Pross. And also when you're studying, really go back through and listen to the lectures and take note of things that she says that's not on her slides. So the humoral immune response, um, this is all mediated by B cells. And the whole purpose of this is to produce antibodies. So you know the B cells turn into plasma cells to make antibodies. They also turn into memory B cells. So memory B cells so we can have that long-term immunity. The antibodies, the whole process of them is neutralization and preventing entry into cells. So we, it's going to be very important to understand the role of antibodies, and we'll get into that as we continue on. So the humoral response, B cell activation, uh, which leads to proliferation, so creating more of that same B cell. Expansion of antigen-specific clones, so this is clonal expansion. This is going to be once we have that specific B cell that reacts to that antigen, so this antibody here that reacts to that antigen perfectly, we're going to create a lot more of just that antibody. So this is clonal expansion. So we're going to get, we're going to clone this antibody and create multiple and multiple, multiple copies. So that way we can build up a proper defense. Also remember, it's important to know that T cell dependent. So we need T cells to do class switching. So if we don't have T cells, we're only going to produce IgM right here. If we have no T cells, so it's a T cell independent response, we're only producing IgM. If we have T cell interaction, so if T cells are interacting with the B cells, then we will be able to create IgG, IgA, IgE, depending on what the scenario calls for. And make sure you remember what IgG, IgA, and IgE are used for, as well as that IgD just hangs out on the cell surface. So here, here they are again, IgG, A, D, E, and M. M being the first one that is made. Hey Daniel, what is uh, IgM's job exactly besides being like the first one synthesized? That is it. So it has it has a normal job of uh, neutralization, but it is not really as specific and it's not as versatile as IgG. So IgM and IgG have very similar jobs, but G is a lot more specific and a lot more effective. Gotcha. Thanks, man. No problem. All right. So the different ways that we can simulate our B cell. So here, um, this is kind of an overview. She goes into it. Um, if we have a naive B cell, so the naive B cell has IgM and IgD on its surface. Make sure you know that those two uh, factors right there that a naive B cell is going to have IgM and IgD. Remember, IgD just sits on the cell surface. It is a normal B cell receptor. It's not going to really do anything for us. IgM being the one that we can class switch. 
So it's the one that's going to allow us to change into the different types. If we go through this process, we have the microbe that interacts with it. This is the cell we want. So now it's an activated B cell. So it can actually do things it can help uh, helper T cells. It can create antibodies. It can attract macrophages. We're going to go through clonal expansion. So we're going to create multiple copies of this same one. Depending on this microbe and the activation process, we can either get antibody secretion, we can get isotype switching, which is going to be T cell dependent. We can get affinity maturation. So affinity maturation is changing the I, the A, the Ig, so the antibody, to be able to fit that microbe more. So this is what she talked about when she talked about changing the invariant chain. I'm sorry, changing the uh, the variable region of our Ig. So if we're changing the variable light chain or the variable heavy chain, this is going to be affinity maturation, or we go through the process of it becoming a memory B cell. So these are our four fates here that we get from this activated B cell. And we're going to go into each one of them. Um, this one, you don't need to know as much. Um, there's not as much detail in this one. It is helpful, though, here in the top part, when it, in the middle. So if you have a protein antigen, so a peptide, then that is going to activate the T cells, which will give us isotype switching. These other two do not have peptides. So we're looking at lipids, polysaccharides. These antigens do not have peptides. So if they don't have peptides, we don't get class switching. We only get IgM. So that's the big picture from this slide here, is the difference between which type of antigen we're presenting. If an antigen is peptide, we can get class switching. If it's not peptide, then we are only working with IgM because we need that T cell interaction to be able to get class, class switching. Uh, for IgD, it is mainly just a receptor. It is mainly just a receptor. It's not one that can actually go out and um, neutralize any sort of cell. And we're going to go over the other, the actual functions of the immune globulins. But IgD is not going to be one that can uh, induce opsonization or neutralization. It's just used as a receptor. It is important to note, though, that the one that does have IgD on it being your naive B cell. But make sure you know these differences, that if we have a peptide, we're activating T cells. If we're activating T cells, we get class switching. If we're using a lipid, a polysaccharide, a nucleic acid, then we are not activating T cells, so we're only getting IgM. Hey, Daniel. On the previous slide that said B cell simulation, so is that, um, is that the whole class switching? Where? So is this, is this class switching here? Because this, they're producing the different antibodies? This slide? Yes. Um, so the slide, the one that's that's class with, yeah, excuse me, class switching is the isotype switching. So it's the second one, the one where I, I kind of in my slides I wrote T cell dependent or T cell depth. Um, that one is class switching. Um, the top one, antibody secretion, isn't referring to class switching. Uh, memory B cells is not affinity maturation. It's just when we're adjusting that antibody or that Ig to be able to. Okay, thank you. The one on the bottom. So what slide is this? Slide 25. Slide 25 is showing us class switching only at the top. So class switching is the same thing as isotype switching. So it's changing which class of immune globulin we are using. And that can only be done if we have a peptide, um, which will give us T cell interaction. OK, thank you. No OK, so our. The actual locations, we, we talked about this. I, I made sure to stress it in my last review section. Make sure you know where certain cells are in our lymph nodes. So our germinal centers being very high affinity for B cells. So we have our germinal centers here, and then we have the, uh, the medulla, and we have our paracortical sections here. So our germinal center being the B cells, paracortical being T cells, and then the medulla being plasma cells. So make sure you know which cells are where. This is just another image here showing us how we actually get these T and B cells to meet. This is just an image showing the process. So here we have a dendritic cell actually presenting the MHC class two. You should know this is class two from how it looks. Remember there is a difference in the image between class two and class one. So here it's showing class two and it's binding to a CD4 helper T cell. 
that helper, helper T cell will then activate, will create more effector cells, and then it will come in contact in between the germinal center between a B cell and T cell. So at this point here, where we have number two, number two is going to allow us for class switching. So two is going to allow us for isotype switching. Because of this interaction between a CD4, so a helper T cell, and a B cell, we will actually be able to create different types of immune globulin. So this is where the interaction occurs. So this is why it's so important to have these dendritic cells that traverse throughout the vasculature, get to the lymph nodes, so our secondary lymph organ, and present to the CD4 cells, and then go through the whole process of CD4, then it going through clonal expansion. Once it goes through that expansion, then we can present from the CD4 onto the B cell, and it has this interaction, which will then allow us to go through class switching. This is what it actually looks like in an electron micrograph. Um, it's called a SMAC complex. So when they've just, so it starts with the uh, the one receptors here. Once these receptors here, then all of the other receptors start to attach, and this allows for transfer of different peptides to go across, and allows for different signals to send. So it allows for those co-stimulatory signals. So this is the co-stimulatory signals we were talking about. These signals are very, very, very important for the immune response. So our first uh, stimulatory signal that we're going to talk about is CD, CD28 and B7. So B7 is going to be on our APC. So it's going to be on our dendritic cell or our macrophage, or depending on the type of MHC, it could be on any nucleated cell. And then CD28 is going to be on our effector cell, on the T cell. So we have here, we have the MHC, so there's going to be an MHC class 2, because we can tell from the shape, our MHC class 2 is going to be binding with the T cell receptor here on the T cell. Now, just that binding is not going to be enough to elicit the response. We also need that CD28 and B7 binding. This is the co-stimulatory. So this signal here will initiate that we need to create IL-2, so interleukin-2. The secondary signal, the co-stimulatory signal, will release a signal that we need to create IL-2 receptor. So IL-2 is an autocrine interleukin. So it's going to be created by this T cell, and it's going to interact with the same T cell. So it's sending a signal to itself. If we have just the first signal, if we just have just MHC class 2 and the TCR, then we only get IL-2. We don't have the receptor for IL-2. So we're sending a signal to tell ourselves something, but we can't process that signal. So with CD28 and B7, we then create the receptor and we can process this signal. This IL-2 interleukin tells this cell, this T cell, that we need to create more of yourself. So that's the whole purpose of this. this is we're going to get clonal expansion. This is how we're going to get more effector cells. So we have here the MHC class 2 APC, so a dendritic cell or a macrophage, is most likely a dendritic cell, interacts with the TCR, releases IL-2. CD28, B7, interact, release IL-2 receptor. This allows for us to get more of this T cell to be able to act in this scenario. Now the other hand, instead of CD28, we have CTLA-4. CTLA-4 is going to be on the T cell, so just like CD28 was on the T cell, except CTL CTLA-4 is going to stop activation. So here's a normal signal here. So this one, we have the MHC and the TCR. This normal would give us an increase in IL-2. CD28, B7 is going to give us an increase in IL-2R. But in this case, instead of B7 binding to CT28, it's going to bind to CTLA-4. Here, it's going to inhibit that response. So this is actually going to downregulate our immune response. So this is important because if we do not have this, then we have an overactive immune system. This CTLA-4 is going to be used when we need to stop our immune response. If we didn't have that, we'd have constant autoimmunity. This is how we can attenuate our, our immune response after we've already dealt with the antigen or with the microbe. All right, so our helper T cells and how it actually binds. So we have here, once again, the MHC class 2 binding onto our TCR. The one that we use for our helper T cells and B cells, instead of CD28 and um, B7, we use CD40 and CD40 ligand. All right, so I know there's a whole bunch of different names. Just make sure you know which one 
coincides with which. So here we have the B cell at the bottom and the T cell at the top. So remember the red up here is the helper T cell. The purple at the bottom is the B cell. On the B cell, we have CD40. On the T cell, we have CD40 ligand. This is our co-stimulatory mechanism that we need for class switching. So remember the only time that we have a helper T cell and a B cell interacting is to allow us cl class switching. Um, yes, a bone. Hopefully I didn't butcher your name uh, or hone. Re reading is tough today. Um, CTLA-4 downregulates the immune response. So the whole point of CTLA-4 is to stop the immune response. Um, sometimes it can be in, it, it can activate at the wrong time, which is going to not allow us to have an immune response. But the normal occasion is when we're using CTLA-4 is to stop or attenuate our immune response so it doesn't go crazy. Um, so make sure you know these co-stimulatory mechanisms. So we had the first one, it was CD28 and B7 that allows for T cells to release IL-2 and IL-2R. Remember, it's autocrine here. And it's going to allow us to create more T cells to handle this response. Then we have CTLA-4, which is going to be on the T cell. And that will stop our immune response. And then we have CD40 and CD40 ligand, which is between the B and T cell. And that's going to allow us to do class switching. Make sure you know which receptor is on which cells. That is very, very important to know which receptor is on which cells. So same thing. This is a summary. This is for detail. Like she said, this one is very crazy. You are not going to need to go through all this. Uh, if it is inhibited, it is a fact cancer too, or is it? Um, so it can it can uh, relate to cancer as well, because if you have, um, so answering Leah's question in the chat, I think you often see the chat on my screen anyways. Um, so if you have CTLA, if your cancer cell, instead of presenting MHC class one, it presents CTLA-4. If your cancer cell presents CTLA-4, then it will not be destroyed. So cancer can use that as, a, as another way to evade the immune system. And she's going to get into that um, later, I believe, in the next in lecture six, I believe. Um, but the different ways that cancer can evade the immune system. And one of them is by um, internalizing class one MHC or initiating that cell cycle arrest. So initiating that CTLA-4 um, co-stimulation. Um, so once again, clinical relevance, autoimmunity, cancer, infectious disease, and immunodeficiency. And we'll get into all of these a lot as we continue. All right, so putting it all together, it is important to go through these summaries. She's very, very helpful with these summaries, and this lecture was a little shorter. There was a lot more review in this lecture than there needed to be, but it is helpful to know. Make sure you know the B cell process, the whole purpose of the B cell process and the T cell subsets and what each one of them does. You should know it at this point, but this is very, on slide 37, this is very good information for your study sheet. Um, so Elizabeth, IL-2 is an autocrine uh, interleukin. And what it does is when IL-2 interacts with the IL-2 receptor on the T cell, it will signal to that same T cell that's speaking to itself, it'll signal that it needs to make more copies of itself. So it's going to, it's actually going to initiate into mitosis. It's going to go and go from G0 into G1 S phase, then G2, it goes through the whole process to create more of that effector T cell. So it's, it's a self signal that allows you to create more of yourself. So this is how we're going to get that clonal expansion. All right, so putting it together with antigens, make sure you know these. Once again, she is really good at summarizing this information. This is just the bare bones you need to add onto this information. This, the summaries itself are not enough to score on the tests. More information and more summary, and that's essentially the rest. Um, also, before I go into the next lecture, I do want to note, I don't know if you all have figured it out or any TA has spoken to you all about it, um, but obviously I know all of you all want to get A's, um, and that can happen if you study hard enough. It really can. Make sure you know, though, uh, it's 50 questions. So 50 questions, each question essentially is worth two points. Um, an A is a 92 or higher, so that means you can miss four questions on every test. Um, the better you do on your first few tests, so on block one, you need to kill block one. If you kill block one, 
then it's a lot easier as you go along. If on block one, let's say you get a, you know, you get a 90 on your first test, it is really hard mathematically to push up and get that A. Not that it's impossible, but it is really, really hard. So you need to go in assuming and really thinking and preparing to miss one or two questions at max. You do not want to give yourself that opportunity of missing four. Because now that you've missed four, you're at a 92, which means you need to get a 92 or higher on every single test from here on out, which is really, really, really hard. You want to give yourself as much leeway as possible. Um, so keep that in the back of your head that when we're talking about A's in this class, uh, we're talking about 92 and up. And 92 and up is missing four or less questions on these tests. All right. So lecture five, hypersensitivity and immune tolerance. This one's pretty cool. She actually, we actually get a little bit more into the clinical sense, uh, into what's going on in this in this class. Uh, we'll get a lot more into the clinical sense actually from this lecture on. From this lecture on, it is all clinical, and we're looking at a lot more real world examples, not looking at the same thing over and over again with the types of immunity. Um, here, the objectives. Once again, she has she has here listing the mechanisms, but also describing air and FOXB3. That's pretty important to know that. And also to know these different uh, diseases, whether it be IPEX or polyendocrine syndrome. You need to know those. Make sure you really know the Gel and Coombs uh, hypersensitivity classification. It is very simple once you break it down to its bare minimum, uh, but make sure you, you know those. That's definitely something that's going to be tested on is the different types of hypersensitivity. And it's something that's actually going to come back a lot in a lot of courses. So you'll see it here. You'll see it later here. You will also see it in uh, physio. You'll see it in PATH, and you'll see it in FARM. So make sure you know these uh, this hypersensitivity classification. We'll go through it. So immune tolerance. Um, immune tolerance is um, the unresponsiveness to certain types of self. So it's being able to tolerate certain types of self-presentation. Remember, when we say presentation of self, that's when we're doing education, and that's when we're talking about the MHC. So this is when we have those specific types of T cells that are presenting in the thymus and they're presenting to the other T cells saying this is what an MHC class one looks like. This is what an MHC class two looks like. You need to be able to react to these. Um, so tolerance sometimes can be not generating self-reacting cells. So it's the success of negative selection. So remember negative selection is getting rid of those cells that overreact to self. So immune tolerance is gonna be protecting our body from that autoimmunity. Um, so we need to have the self-reacting cells, but these antigens are not exposed or they are actively downregulated. So this is kind of how we deal with those self-reactive cells. And we'll get into that. If we have a failure of any of these mechanisms, that's when we get an autoimmune disorder. So that autoimmune can be from the lack of negative selection or the lack of the cells that present those self-antigen or the lack of downregulation. So we have those three mechanisms right there which can induce autoimmunity. So it is difficult to assess the uh, the tolerance in the human system. We do have way, microbes have way too many complex antigens. So they have all these different epitopes, so all the different uh, variations, molecular variations on the outside of their cell membrane or cell wall. And then also there's a lot of complex genetics involved. So between what you get from your mother and your father to create your different immune response, remember we have that chromosome six is the HLA, master chromosome for that and it's only a small portion of that chromosome is what codes for the mhc so we only have a certain amount of variation same thing as we'll get into when we do class switching at the end she has a little diagram a genetic diagram which you'll see in block three of genetics that um it's we have a very limited amount even though there's a lot of variability there is still a limit to the types of antibodies that we can make in the human body Hey Daniel, could you go back to the um, the tolerance slide on the last one? You said was always on autoimmunity, and then you listed like like you put it in layman's terms the three mm -hmm. things like you said lack of negative selection, and I just missed the other two. So there's uh, lack of negative selection, so not killing those cells that overreact. Then there's lack of the cells that present. So remember, we have those cells, those specific cells in the thymus that present self. If we don't have those then we don't have any sort of positive selection or negative selection at all because we can't see how they react. And then there was also the 
actively downregulating. So cells, so if we don't have the active downregulation of those overreacting cells, then those cells are going to be enhanced and we'll have autoimmunity. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. So antigens that have a role in tolerance. Um, so adjuvants, this is something she kind of like briefly mentioned. Um, and this is something you're going to get into a lot more when you get into vaccine formation. Adjuvants is just something to stimulate the immune response. Um, so and, and it's going to it's going to stimulate it more. So that way we can get an immune response to that area. So then they can pick up the, the antigen that we're presenting. So if we're using a vaccine and it's a vaccine that has peptides, it has the peptides of the virus that we want you to become immune to. If we just inject you with that, with the peptides, peptides are so small, the chances of getting enough of an immune reaction in that area to really stimulate that memory in the immune system is very, very weak. So what we do, or what scientists do, is they, they add uh, certain irritants. So they'll either add like um, certain PAMPs, or they'll add oil or certain chemicals to that peptide mixture. So that way, when they inject you with it, you have not only the peptides there, but you have other harmless, harmless other uh, additions to that vaccine. They're going to bring an immune response there. So we have a higher chance of your dendritic and your macrophages seeing that antigen that we want them to see. So that's all an adjuvant is. It's just a way to increase the immune response in that area in a harmless way, but to increase your responsiveness and to induce your memory. So would that be something like um, like a cytokine exam for an example, like calling it over to that area? Uh, you can. Um, so you can, and she'll get into it in the next lecture. That can be a little dangerous. Um, just like jumping ahead, you can if you have too much of a cytokine in the area, you can get what's called a cytokine storm, which will it's just a huge increase of an immune response in a way that you can't control. So they do use cytokines and like chemokines usually what they use is like a specific lipid or oil that will act as um, an irritant. So then what it is, is it's, it's acting as an irritant. So it's attracting because you have something there um, in the inflammation response, it's attracting those neutrophils, macrophage, and dendritic cells to that area because it's something that's foreign and your endothelial cells see it as foreign. Then because we're bringing all those neutrophils, macrophage, and dendritic cells, some of them will likely be exposed to that antigen that we're actually using as a vaccination. Um, so it, it, it does the same idea as a cytokine. You can use a cytokine or a chemokine, um, but be weary of using that terminology just because in the next lecture, I think it's the next lecture, if she follows the same um, information that the lecture that Dr. Yugen, who did it last year does, then she'll go over that cytokine storm and how it can be kind of dangerous. Um, because I know like right now what you all hear, and I, I thought the same thing when I was sitting in class, um, they talk about like all the positives of the cytokines and the cytokines can stimulate the immune response. It's like, well, okay, so then like for cancer, for instance, why don't you just inject the cell with, uh, or inject the area with a whole bunch of cytokines and get a whole bunch of immune cells there and kill them. There are huge side effects um, to that and uh, that can be a problem. And I think that's what's happening with uh, like COVID-19 people were like being heavily affected by that cytokine storm. Yeah, so the so with uh, COVID specifically, the it's not the virus that's the problem, it's the cytokine storm. Um, that's why people are having to be put on ventilators because of that, because the cytokine storm is causing such an issue um, with your own body when the amount of inflammation attacking your, your respiratory system. And that's why for a while, you'll go through this later when you get into physio or biochem. I think biochem and um, farm, but... Uh, steroids. Steroids are used to reduce your immune response. So it's kind of weird, but they were using dexamethasone, which is a very, very strong steroid in treating COVID. The reason they were using that was not because of the COVID itself, it was because to reduce that immune response, that inflammatory response caused by that cytokine storm. Um, so cytokines are great, but in moderation. Um, they, are, they need to be seen in very small amounts. If we get too high of a level we can have some really bad side effects. And you should be getting into that in the next lecture. Do Thank there, you. Are the irritants the one that like give you the sniffles after you get a vaccine or is that just like a placebo effect? Uh, this, so the sniffles is going to actually come from your, your own immune response. Um, so the irritant, so like if you get a flu vaccine, which most of you should get that now, I'm hopefully going to be going getting to mine, getting mine in a few days. But like when you get a vaccine on your arm and then you get that huge red bump, 
that swelling there, that's caused by the irritants. So the irritants, that, that's actually a good sign. That's showing us that we're having inflammation at the site of injection. That's showing us that we're getting neutrophils, macrophage, dendritic cells to actually go to that site of in, uh, injection. So that, that irritation there is, or that inflammation is caused by the irritant. That's caused by the adjuvant. Then that secondary response that you have that you get sniffles or you get uh, a slight increase in temperature, you get a little achy, that's your immune response itself. So those um, flu-like symptoms that you get from a vaccine, that's actually just your immune response reacting to the antigen and, and uh, creating memory, creating antibodies and creating memory B and T cells. Okay, thanks. No problem. Brandon, I am not sure if they offer it. Um, what they did last year for us was they had a, uh, USF Health had a um, kind of like a health fair where we were able to go get them. Um, but I don't think they're going to be able to do that. Uh, you might be able to do the Publix thing. I don't know if you need insurance. Um, if you have insurance, you can go to Publix and get the $10 gift card, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, but it has to be a Publix with a full pharmacy. So I don't know if the one on campus has a full pharmacy, but the other one on Fowler does, if you live by campus. And apparently Student Health Services is also providing free flu shots to students. So you guys are, but you have to make an appointment. Um, you guys are killing it up here in the chat with all of your information. Oh, you guys are super informed. All right, so antigens have a role in tolerance. Um, this is the same thing we've been saying. Um, make sure you kind of go through this. It, it's got a lot of text and um, a lot of this stuff that she's already said or gone over. I know she spent a good amount of time on this slide uh, in class. It's it's a lot of stuff that you've already said or you guys should already know, but just kind of go through it, glance through it, and make sure you under, understand the material. All right, so where tolerance is generated. So here she kind of threw some terms at you. Um, central tolerance and peripheral tolerance. So central tolerance is actually our education. So central tolerance is just where we educate our, uh, our lymphocytes. So whether it be in the thymus or the bone marrow, depending on the lymphocyte you're talking about. Um, and this is also where we have positive selection, negative selection. Remember, positive selection is when we are selecting for cells that have a small reaction to self. And negative selection is when we are, reacting, when we are selecting uh, to destroy or kill cells that have too much reaction to self. So negative selection is to stop autoimmunity. Positive selection is to create a source of immunity. Uh, and then our peripheral tolerance, this is secondary. Uh, this is our secondary tolerance levels. And we'll get into this. This occurs at the secondary lymphoid organs. So your lymph nodes and your spleen and your galt. Um, so this is if, it's, if it recognizes self too much. So if it passes our central tolerance, if it passes our primary level of education, gets to the secondary level and it recognizes self a little too much, it's either killed or inactivated. And inactivated inactivated being CTLA-4, and then killed through uh, apoptosis. Our central tolerance here, and this is uh, in the thymus specifically, is this picture. It's a central method of tolerance for T cells. Um, so cell death will occur if the T cell uh, reacts too strongly to self-antigen on the MHC. Remember, self-antigen just being MHC class 1 or class 2. And then we will induce apoptosis in that cell. This is all done through a cell that we mentioned in the last um, the last review session um, is Tregs. So Tregs, it's uh, regulatory T cells. They have they are CD4 positive, they're CD25 positive, and they're FOXP3 positive. Make sure you know those markers. So they are a helper T cell because they're CD4 positive. Um, but the help, the main distinguishing factors is the CD CD25 positive and the FOXP3 positive. But make sure you do know they are a helper T cell. So a Treg is a helper T cell because it's CD4 positive. These have intermediate affinity for self antigens. And I saw that being a, a question in the review or in the uh, the lecture. So intermediate affinity means it can it can bind to some and it can bind to others, but it doesn't have too much affinity. So it doesn't have very very high affinity for self antigen. It has a middle road. It's kind of like a Goldilocks effect. Our types of CD4 cells. So we have Th1. We talked about this before. Th1 kill. So Th1 work with CD8. Then Th2. These are the allergy ones. Works with CD4, uh, but it also works with. Um, oh, my brain's blanking. Oh, um, IgE and mast cells. 
TH17, this is one that's used when TH1 and TH2 don't work for that scenario. And then Tregs being the other one, CD4, CD25, and FOXP um, positive cells. These are going to be the ones that are going to help us with tolerance and education. So make sure you know these different types of, T of uh, CD4 T cells. So remember, these are all helper cells, all four of these. So a lack of central tolerance. So immune disorders, autoimmune disorders that we have when we lack central tolerance. So we mentioned these in the objectives. These are pretty important to know. AIR and IPEX, we're going to go into them individually later on. But make sure you know the initial cause of the autoimmune issue. So IPEX is going to be an issue that we have with Tregs. And then AIR is going to be an issue that we have where we get antibody and lymphocyte immediate injury to certain organs. Um, we're going to go into them. Yeah, so Tregs are the ones, they're the major player in tolerance and education because Tregs are the regulatory ones. So these are the ones that are going to present. So we've talked about it a lot. We've said there is a certain cell, a certain type of T cell within the thymus that we use that presents that self antigen to other T cells. That's the Treg. The Treg is also going to be the one that is going to then eliminate that cell that overreacts or eliminates that cell that doesn't react enough. Uh, will she ask on TH cells? Yes. She said they were there, but you do not. Uh, yeah, no, she will ask. Yeah, she, she will definitely ask. Um, she will ask on the different types of TH cells. She probably won't ask like directly, but in a question stem, she will include it. And you need to be able to go from step one to two to three to five, all the way back to one to answer it. Um, so you need to know these different ones. So that way you can answer those questions. So T regs also help with that. Um, so remember, education is positive and negative selection. So education itself, um, this is to answer Jacob's question. Education itself is presenting the T cell with the self antigen and seeing how it responds. If it responds just right, then we have positive selection. If it responds too much, we have negative selection. If it doesn't respond at all, we have negative selection. So make sure that you know that education involves positive and negative selection. They're almost interchangeable. In order to have education, you have to have positive and negative selection. Are the TH1 um, so uh, for Savannah, TH1 and TH2 like MHC1 and 2? Um, yes and no. So the problem with that train of thought TH1 is a CD4 cell. TH2 is a CD4 cell. The TH1 CD4 cell will activate CD8. So it'll, it'll work like MHC class 1, but with a lot more steps. The TH2 CD4 cell will activate MHC class 2. So it does it, but in multiple steps. It also depends on what you need. If you need, if your CD4 cell recognizes, if that helper T cell recognizes we need to kill this cell, then we'll use TH1. If it recognizes that we need to neutralize it or opsonize it, anything with antibodies, it's going to go MHC class 2. Apex was an issue, was that? Uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't actually, um, I, I didn't get to that, uh, Lexia. I was about to, but some questions came up, um, which is not wrong. Um, but we'll get through each IPEX and AIR individually. Um, so AIR, polyendocrine syndrome here. AIR is an autoimmune regulatory issue. Um, in this disorder, self-antigens are not expressed in the thymus. So in this one specifically, we don't have presentation. So because there's no presentation of self-antigen, then we can have a lack of negative selection. So we're going to have a multitude of cells that either have energy, so they don't react to cells, they don't react to self at all, so they can't protect us, or we have ones that, act, that activate too much to self. So because we have no presentation, we're missing that step in education. We're missing that negative selection in education, saying this guy reacts way too much to self, we need to either inactivate it through CTLA, or we need to kill it through apoptosis. So because we don't have that, then we have cells that are reacting to self way too much, attacking, and we have here either the pancreas, the parathyroid, or the adrenals. Now, the pancreatic islet cells, this can lead to type 1 diabetes. You'll get into it a lot when you have block 2 um, with uh, one of my favorite teachers in the entire program, block 2 in biochem, and he's also block 3 
in Immuno is um, Dr. Seifeng. Make sure you do not skip your first biochem lecture, which is in the middle of the test block. Um, it's after your genetics. It's after your genetics test. Do not skip um, that first biochem lecture of block two. But um, air is just a lack of negative selection. So it's an issue where we're not presenting to the T cells. And then peripheral tolerance, mature T cells recognize self antigens, but they do not respond. So this one's a little different. Um, that not responding is gonna give us energy. So like we said, energy is when they do nothing. So they have no response whatsoever. Um, and just being without, and then energy being energy. So it has no energy. That's the stem root there. Um, T cell recognizes antigen, but it has no no co stimulation. So whether it be a lack of CD28, um, the CD28 and B7 response that creates IL2 to create more cells, or it could be a lack of CD40 ligand. It's just a lack of those co stimulatory responses. So you get no activation. If you have no activation, then the T regs will suppress that type of cell. Um, we want the T regs to suppress that type of cell because we don't want more of that cell. Because if we have a cell that has energy, it doesn't react. We don't want any more of that cell around in the body. It's not doing anything for us. And then here, this is just a, a graph showing energy. So energy here, we have the dendritic cell. And then we have our uh, helper T cell here. If the helper T cell has no co-stimulation, so we're not getting that IL-2, IL-2R response to create more of it, then the cell does nothing. It's unresponsive. Then Tregs will inactivate that cell. And these are just your other responses here. So suppression, so the T regs gonna come by and stop activation of this cell if this cell re uh, reacts too highly. Same thing with deletion, if it reacts too highly, it's the same idea. We're going to, the T reg will stimulate to destroy this cell. So these two at the bottom here, suppression, deletion, this occurs with, all of these are negative selection. Suppression, deletion is if it's overreacting to self and energy when it's not reacting to self at all. Okay, I'm going to go back up to IPEX. I think she has another slide on IPEX, but I, I'm going to go back up to it just, just for fun. Um, so FOXP3 being that marker that we have on those T regs, if there's a mutation on in FOXP3, then we don't have that marker on our T regs. So our T regs themselves actually experience energy. So here, if we don't have T regs, then we don't have education and we don't have positive or negative selection. So air is a lack of negative selection because we're not presenting. So we have cells that are way too overactive. And then IPEX is gonna be a lack of Tregs specifically. So air doesn't mean that Tregs are wrong or inhibited or not there. It's just a gene that is stopping us from presenting. The Tregs here in, Fo in, I in IPEX have a mutation in their FOXP3 so the Tregs have energy. So they're not going through their process of either eliminating or um, inactivating certain cells. I'm pretty sure there's another slide on it, but I just wanted to cover that briefly. Daniel, would the FOXP3 deficiency in Tregs affect more of the peripheral tolerance or the central tolerance of T cells? That would, that would affect central tolerance because that's where you find your Tregs in your thymus and in the bone marrow. So that might be why it's slightly out of order. We'll see. So B cell central tolerance, uh, T dependent and independent. So we, we kind of already have gone through this. So if it's T dependent, then tolerance is through the T cells. If it's T independent, it's through the B cells. Remember the differences between your T dependent and independent antigens. T dependent antigen is gonna be a peptide. T independent antigen will be a lipid, polysaccharide, nucleic acid, something that is not a peptide. T dependent gives us Ig class switching. T independent, we only get IgM. Make sure you remember those. You should be able to rattle those off. Um, I can do it because I've done this. You guys, if you can't do it yet, get to that point to where you're either talking with someone or using a whiteboard like I suggested and just like writing this stuff down and just, just regurgitating all of this information and making sure it's all correct. All right, so our B cell tolerance, uh, central tolerance here, um, this is done in the bone marrow. So negative selection in the bone marrow is done through death through apoptosis. 
most negative selection is done. Um, there is a difference between B cell and T cell. T cell, we have the ability to inactivate them. Here with B cells, we only kill them. That is, that is the option. Um, so receptor editing, this is unique to B cells because the receptor being the Ig, the antibody. So here, remember receptor editing is mainly gonna occur on the light chain. So these ones on the outside, the variable light chain. Um, so it removes self-acting B cells through apoptosis and it modifies the sequence of the light chain. So peripheral energy, so autoreactive B cells that escape these checkpoints, they can arise de novo through hypermutations. Um, so they are excluded from lymphoid and splenic follicles. They're just kind of around in the periphery. Um, most antigens require T cells, so antigen recognition without additional stimuli. Um, and if it's unresponsive, if it has energy, once again, we will get to the process of apoptosis. So when you think B cell, any sort of B cell tolerance, you are just killing it. You are not inactivating it. Right. So organ-specific autoimmune diseases. Um, this one she kind of glossed over. Um, it's not that detailed. So if you have organ-specific uh, diseases, you have an immune response directed to antigens specific to that organ. So this is where she kind of she brought up that movie um, and book, Little Woman, uh, Little Women, yeah, Little Woman, uh, because of rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever just being a response that you have of uh, antibodies that you're creating to a strep. And over time, that strep antigen looks very similar to a, uh, an antigen itself that you have in the cardiac system. So your immune system over time will cross-react and it'll start attacking your own cardiac system. Um, you get this in type 1 diabetes, like we explained earlier. So if you have lack of the, uh, the negative selection, then you can get T cells that will attack your pancreatic islet cells, which is what creates insulin. So if you have T cells attacking those, then you're not going to be able to make insulin in any form. And that's where you can get type 1 diabetes. Um, thyroiditis is just inflammation in the thyroid because you have, you have T cells attacking the thyroid. So all of these, this is just saying organ specific. So it's attacking that specific organ. So these are antibodies or a cell mediated response targeted specifically at one organ. They do see that people with one organ specific disease has an increased incidence of developing another one. So that's something to note. Um, but if you have systemic autoimmune disease, this is a little different. So this is when you have a cell media response or an antigen antibody complex that then, uh, so CMI, Melissa stands for cell mediated, uh, immune response. That makes sense. So it's, it's cell media. So this is CMI specifically when you have, uh, cytotoxic cells doing the immune response. Um, so we either have humoral response or the CMI humoral being your antibodies and then the, uh, the CMI being your cell-mediated immune response, so your cytotoxic. So here in your systemic, we have cell-mediated or antibody and antigen complexes. Um, we'll get into this when we get into type 3 hypersensitivity, but you can uh, develop things like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, or inflammation because these antibody antigen complexes can get stuck in certain areas and cause massive amounts of inflammation. Same thing with your CMI, if it's attacking certain things, like it could be attacking your cartilage, for instance, um, in rheumatoid arthritis. So it's attacking chondrocytes in your cartilage, then you just get mass amounts of inflammation throughout your whole body because you have your immune system attacking just a wide strain of cells. <coughs> so some causes, um, so uh, irregular regulation and poly, uh, polyclonal stimulation, Treatment is just steroids, down-regulating the immune response, either steroids or certain types of chemotherapy that can reduce your immune response. People with one systemic disease have a greater chance of developing a second one. That should also make sense. Okay. So here, um, so once again, chromosome six, showing us HLA and the different regions. So it's a very, very small piece of the short arm of chromosome six that's giving us all the genetics um, for our uh, human leukocyte. Uh, antigens, so our MHCs. Um, so what she was pointing out here is that um, there, there is somewhat of a relation between a specific HLA, so HLA B27 correlating to a autoimmune issue called ankylosing spondylitis. Um, there are small correlations, so it's not directly related to it. So genetics of HLA don't have a direct correlation to autoimmune diseases, but they, they don't help the situation if you have issues with those HLAs. So if you have some 
that are that you either have mutations in or you have a translocation in, then you can it will not help your chances of developing these sorts of autoimmune issues, but they're not directly correlated. There's only small correlations. So make sure you note that just because you have this mutation doesn't mean you're going to be getting ankylosing spondylitis. What that means is you might have a higher chance of getting it. All right, so autoimmunity genes outside of HLA, of course, CTLA-4. If we have an, if we have an issue with CTLA-4, then we have fatal autoimmunity. So like I said before, the importance of CTLA-4 is that we can stop our immune response so that we can put a limit to it. We can actually attenuate that, that immune response and say, okay, we have defeated the microbe. That is enough. Let's calm down and let's get to the next step. So if we don't have that CTLA-4, then we're never actually stopping those T cells. If we're not stopping them, then that's when we can develop things like autoimmunity. And this one can be particularly fatal because we have no way of stopping it whatsoever. So other factors involved, um, Th1 versus Th2 response. Um, like we said before, a, a greater Th2 response is going to be an increase in allergy. A greater Th1 response is going to be an increase in cytotoxic cells. Now, we also see differences with gender. There are certain types that we see more in females than we do in males. Um, and it's going to be an increased risk in infection with autoimmunity because your immune system is concentrating on yourself rather than foreign bodies. Um, so certain infections with autoimmunity, uh, molecular mimicry, this is what we were talking about when we were talking about rheumatic fever. So the cross reaction. So if we have a certain strep infection, um, our body's going to create antibodies to that antigen from strep. That same antigen looks very similar to ones in the cardiac system. So that antibody is, is, that we've created is now reacting to strep molecules, so strep microbes, as well as certain antigens in our cardiac cells, our cardiac myocytes. Um, and then self tissues are, just, are damaged by the microbes, so the bystander effect or removal of uh, sequestration. So what that is, is that's essentially the same idea behind uh, inflammatory, chronic inflammation. So the bystander response is being any cell in that area is being killed by our widespread immune response. So we have a bacteria. Um, this actually specific bystander effect is going to be very, very similar to what we have in um, with COVID, that the respiratory cells, so certain cells, certain pneumocytes in your lung are getting attacked just because we have that cytokine storm and that overinflammation. And then generalized activation of the immune cells, of the immune system, this is also what we see in COVID, where we see just a, a massive upregulation of adapted immunity, just a huge upregulation of our immune cells is just that cytokine storm. We're getting a huge increase just to be able to fight off what we're trying to fight off, but we're not creating a directed response. We're just creating a huge response, just attacking everything. Um, so removal of sequestration is just removing certain things uh, of that cell. So if we are, the bystander effect is gonna be killing things in the area, Removal is going to be your uh, phagocytizing cells that you're not supposed to be phagocytizing. So bystander effect is going to be more from cytokines. Um, and so, yeah, bystander effect is mainly cytokines. So if we're releasing cytokines, um, for instance, the NK cells and the T cells, the way they work through apoptosis and initiate apoptosis is going to be perforins and granzymes. If we have an NK cell there that's releasing a whole bunch of perforins and granzymes, and it's releasing it to the cell that we need to kill itself, but also other cells next to it. Or, and then removal of sequestration is if we have macrophages coming into the area, remember macrophages eat everything. So they'll eat the infected cell and then they'll eat some other things uh, in the area as well. And some of those might cause issues with those tissues. So we might have issues where um, we're losing cells that are very uh, important to the function of that tissue just because the macrophage is going through eating everything or because we're releasing cytokines that are initiating apoptosis, killing cells that are not supposed to be dying. All right, so now we get to autoimmunity and hypersensitivity. So autoimmunity is being too much of the immune response, um, and there's going to be hypersensitivity is also going to be too much, uh, too much response to our immune system. And we have this Gell and Coombs classification. You don't need to know Gell, like, you don't need to know it's the name, but we do need to know the classification steps. Uh, so yes, inflammation alone can kill cells because remember, inflammation is just an influx of macrophage, dendritic cells, or neutrophils, so cells that will kill and eat anything. So if we have a whole bunch of inflammation in that area, we're getting a whole bunch of macrophages. Those macrophages are just going to eat, 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 and not stop until the system has resolved, until that issue or that microbe, we're getting signals saying, the microbe's gone, we can stop now. 
But if you have chronic inflammation, so inflammation that's constantly occurring, then those macrophages are just going to be eating everything and they're going to be eating cells that they're not supposed to be eating and destroying tissues they're not supposed to be destroying. Um, so gel and Coombs classification, we have four different types right here. So IgE, allergy. Um, type one is allergy related. So anything that's allergy. So it's, it's pretty quick. Um, we're going to get into it. It's, it's, it's a very quick response, but you also do have that latent response. Um, type two, uh, this is going to be antibody to self. So this is when you're creating an IgE or an IgM to your own organs or to your own tissues. Then three is complexes. Complexes being antigen antibody complexes. So like we were saying before, so when an antigen is floating around, if we create antibodies and antibodies going to stick to it, and if we have multiple antibodies that stick to it, they become large complexes of one antigen and multiple antibodies. Those can float throughout the body and get stuck in certain areas and cause inflammation. And then type four is T cell related. So it's delayed. This is delayed hypersensitivity. So this is the one that we saw with um, a TB test. And we'll get into each of them individually, but try to try to find those differentiating factors to begin with to turn these like next four slides into one slide. So you could essentially print this slide and then write a whole bunch more information on your type one, type two, type three, type four. Um, also make sure you know the examples of them. Uh, so type one, type one being your allergy. Um, so it occurs seconds to minutes. This is your IgE. Remember, we have been saying nonstop that IgE is what causes allergies. So your IgE antibody binds to your mast cells. And what it does is your mast cells will then release crazy amounts of histamine. And histamine will create this wheel and flare reaction. So wheel and flare reaction, you have here just this whole wheel here of inflammation. So you have the center wheel and you have the flare of inflammation around it in this picture. So we have, that's the entire hypersensitivity reaction type one. So we get IgE binding to mast cells, releasing histamine, and then that histamine then causes that inflammation, that inflammatory response, which is why things like Benadryl, which is labeled as an antihistamine, or Claritin, Zyrtec, things like that can reduce your allergies because they work as antihistamines. So even though the mast cells will release histamine, the medication will stop the histamine. Um, so mast cells are a type of lymph cell. They're actually a, a granulocyte that we, she didn't talk, up, talk about yet, um, but mast cells, the entire importance of them is releasing histamine. And histamine is just used as an inflammatory response. So it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the cytokines that starts the inflammation response. Um, the importance of mast cells, um, so the main importance is going to be helminth, so worm infections, um, but we see that kind of cross-reacting between worm infections, helminth infections, and allergens. Um, most of these allergens are, uh, are not toxic. They can't really kill us, um, but as most of you know, uh, especially now, um, allergies uh, can be very, very frustrating and annoying. And then there are some allergies that can lead to death. So with asthma and anaphylaxis and hay fever, you'll get into that a lot more when you get into uh, farm and physio. Um, and block three of biochem with Dr. Williams when he talks about anaphylaxis. Uh, but anaphylaxis is just a widespread. Um, can I ask a question, Daniel? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yep. So how is uh, the subtype CD4, uh, like TH2, I think it was, uh, interrelated to allergy response uh, with, uh, with like uh, one of these IG, uh, IG markers? Okay, so um, good question. So the way you work backwards is in order to get IgE, you need class switching, right? Because we don't make IgE initially, we make IgM. So the way we convert IgM to IgE is we need T cell interaction with B cells. So the T cell interaction that we actually get with B cells to make IgE is Th2. So if we have Th2 CD4 cells interacting with B cells, we will get IgE. Those, uh -oh. TH, yeah, those Th2 cells are activated by certain peptides in certain types of food, certain types of pollen, certain types of drugs, anything that you might be allergic to. Those Th2 cells will interact with that, stimulate the B cells, to class switch into IgE. The IgE will then go out, link to a whole bunch of mast cells. Essentially, when they when they bind onto the mast cell, all that happens is it sends a signal and the mast cell essentially just explodes with histamine. And you'll get through it when you go into uh, histology because you get to see actual like images of it, but yeah. Cool. Got it, thanks man. 
Uh, no problem. Uh, so local honey actually works as an anti-inflammatory, um, which is why when you have like cough drops and they have uh, lemon and honey in them, honey itself has certain reactions that work anti-inflammatory for some people. So cough drops um, that help sore throat, they have honey in them because the honey will reduce the inflammation in your throat. Um, that's why. So remember, allergies is just an immune response. It's just an inflammatory response. So if we can reduce inflammation, that helps. That's why a lot of companies now are releasing um, like ibuprofen with their allergy medication mixed, um, kind of like NyQuil and stuff like that. They'll have antihistamines as well as uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories combined. All right, so our late phase reaction. So this is just a, uh, a secondary reaction that you get. So you have your first primary reaction, immediate reaction to whatever the allergen is. And then a little later on, you get uh, the secondary, the late phase reaction, which occurs a few hours later, it can last for a while. This is what you see with bug bites. Um, so a mosquito bite. Mosquito bite specifically, you get stung. Within a few moments, you'll have uh, itching and swelling. And then itching and swelling can last for a few days. The reason being because you have that inflammatory response. That inflammatory response is then sen sending signals to get more cells to come and deal with the problem. So the mast cells themselves will release histamine and cytokines to recruit other cells. So they'll recruit eosinophils, they'll recruit PMNs, neutrophils, they'll recruit macrophages, they'll recruit basophils, all to that area, and you'll get that itching and that inflammation for a few days. It will go away, um, but this is another reason why people, um, why you have to use some sort of medic medication for certain bug bites or certain allergies. You can't just take a Benadryl once and be fine. You know, sometimes you have to take the Benadryl and then you have to follow it up if it's a bug bite with cortisone cream because cortisone being a steroid, it can reduce your immune response to that area. So that's kind of why we have to have that. So you see this in late phase. Make sure to not misconstrue the late phase of type one with type four, because it is a different type of cell involved. So in late phase with type one, we're seeing neutrophils, eosinophils, macrophages, and lymphocytes and basophils. Okay, when we get to type four, it's gonna be T cell mediated response. Um, so, here, uh, why IgE versus IgG? This is um, answering actually the question that was just asked. Um, so because there's an increased Th2 response, Th2 is going to cause the class switching from IgM to IgE. Th1 will cause class switching from IgM to IgG. And IgE is used for opsonization, neutralization of the microbe. Th2 is going to cause IgE, which will attach to mast cells and will release histamine, which is what's going to give us that response. So people that are naturally higher in Th2 have allergies. People that are higher in Th1 uh, will not have as bad of allergies. So our isotype switching, this is what I was... Yes, Patrick. Um, so Th2 is going to increase allergy response because Th2, remember both Th1 and 2 are CD4 cells. So they're helper cells. So they allow for... Uh, yes, honey and lemon. Um, so they allow for isotype switching. So Th2 will allow isotype switching into IgE, which is going to have mast cells. And then Th1 is going to allow for isotype switching into IgG. IgG is the main proponent for directed killing for our antibodies. That's going to induce opsonization and neutralization of microbes. Th2 is just going to induce IgE to release histamine. So people that naturally have a higher Th2 response are going to be the people that naturally have more uh, allergies. So our isotype switching, this is the uh, this slide you'll see again in genetics in block three. So essentially here we have the different regions uh, genetically of our pieces of, um, is our codes for our different variable chains. So whether it be the light chain or the heavy, uh, the heavy chain, um, this is the process that we go through. So we do have a limited amount of uh, genetics for our isotype, for our IGs but we can mix and match these to get different types. So even though we create an, IG, an IgG, this IgG can have different regions, different coding regions on them that can have them interact differently. They'll overall do the same idea, but they'll interact with antigens differently. Is that supposed uh, to be like the splicing? Like um, yes. splicing out the introns and exons? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. That is exactly what this is. Yeah, Thank you. you don't, you're welcome. You don't need to know this too, too much right now um, because... You'll go into it a lot in uh, block three of genetics. And um, Ivy will help you out a lot with that because he kind of like throws you into the into the woods. It's like find your way out on that one um, when you get into block three. But she'll help you out a lot with that because 
um, we all had to figure it out a lot. So, um, so type two hypersensitivity this is when you're creating autoantibodies to self antigens. Um, so when you're attacking specific organ based systems. Um, so the mechanism of damage being the complement system, so a wide range damage from the complement, um, chemotaxis, so calling, so remember chemokines or chemotaxis is just recruiting them to a certain location of neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Then you have macrophage, which is just widespread damage, and then TNF and IL-1. Um, so this is the important part to know. So it's good to know here uh, the mechanism of damage, but the mechanism of damage is pretty similar throughout most of these. What's important with type two is knowing the actual specific diseases. So rheumatic fever, we talked about that. That's the cross uh, reaction to the antigen in the heart from a strep. And then Graves disease and Hashimoto's disease. Um, you're gonna, like I wrote on my slides, you're gonna see these a lot in almost every class. So Graves being hyperthyroidism and Hashimoto being hypothyroidism. So hyper being overactive thyroid, hypo being underactive. So the thyroid is not really doing too much. Um, so you don't need to know too much detail of these. Uh, you're gonna go into it a lot um, in your other classes. Uh, so type three is gonna be your immune complexes. So the complex is deposited in the vessel walls and the kidney or in joints, and you can get inflammation there. So what happens is you have, and I believe, does she have a picture on it? She does not. Um, so uh, what happens is you're going to have that antigen. You have that free roaming antigen. The antigen is just flowing, and then you'll get a whole bunch of antibodies that bind to that antigen. When they bind to that antigen, they create a huge web complex that can get stuck in certain areas. Um, as it gets stuck in those areas, then it will release those. Because there's something foreign there, and we have a huge thing that's affecting tissue function, then what we're going to have is our immune system is going to start releasing cytokines and chemokines to induce inflammation because we need macrophages and uh, neutrophils to get there and destroy whatever's causing that lack of function. Well, as you know already, when they get there, it's gonna turn into chronic inflammation. So that chronic inflammation will then break down certain things you have in that area and it'll help, it'll kind of destroy some of the tissue that you have there. And you see that in uh, these diseases right here, rheumatoid arthritis, so in your joints, and then systemic lupus, erythematosus, you're going to go into these a lot more uh, in a lot more detail. What do the antigens bind to again? So the antigens bind the antibodies. So in type 3, it's an, it's an antibody antigen complex. So you have the one antigen, and then you have the antibody that comes, binds to it, and it's going to mark it for some sort of um, disposal, whether it be opsonization, neutralization, or stopping it from entering into the body. Um, so it's going to mark it and stop it from entering into the body. And then you'll have another one come in, mark it, mark it, mark it. And then now you have your antigen surrounded by a whole bunch of antibodies, which can then create that complex that can get stuck in certain areas in the body and then cause that actual inflammatory response. So make sure you know the diseases that are linked to these because in question stems, they can ask you the disease and then ask you what type of hypersensitivity reaction, or they can ask you, they can like just tell you the disease and then ask you steps or what things are occurring or how you can actually stop that. So you have to be able to know all these and work backwards. All right, so uh, our last one, type four hypersensitivity. So this one's delayed. The huge thing with this one is it's T cell mediated. So the others have either been antibody um, or, um, well actually all the other ones have been antibody, so B cell. So uh, the first one being allergy, so that's with IgE, so that's an antibody. The second one is you're creating antibodies to certain areas or certain organs or certain tissues. The third one is antibodies and antigens binding together to make complexes. This one is just T cell mediated. So this is going to be CMI, so cytokine mediated inflammatory reactions or cell mediated inflammatory reactions. Um, so it's delayed because you'll see a reaction 24 to 48 hours. We should know it's going to take that long because to elicit a T cell response, you need a few days. So remember, when you have a T cell response, it's not going to be immediate. You have to go through all those processes of formal presentation. Antibodies that you have already floating around, that can be an immediate response. Um, but through T cell presentation, it's going to take a few days to actually develop that response. Um, so some of the examples being po poison ivy, hair dyes, um, nickel. So when you see people like uh, Dr. Pross mentioned uh, with certain types of jewelry, jewelry that is uh, nickel plated or silver plated that has nickel inside of it. Um, so uh, certain types of silver that aren't as high, which is why some women have to wear gold um, because they don't have a response to that. And then poison oak, all of these things will uh, give a delayed response. And then T cell 
uh, response to mycobacterium tuberculosis, so your TB shot. And she has a picture of that later on. Um, so that will actually give you a result. So if you have a huge, huge, serious reaction, that means you've already been exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis and you can't really get the shot again. And someone asked that while we were in uh, lecture. Um, it's important to note that the TB shot is an example of type four hypersensitivity. Um, so here we're seeing the reaction here. So uh, a normal injection here, we're just exposing you to uh, pieces of TB just small antigens of TB. If you have this huge, terrible T cell reaction, this is a cytokine storm right here. This is a T cell storm in this area. So this is showing that the person has actually dealt with uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. They've come in contact with it and they've been sick from it before. Um, we know that because the T cells are responding in a very, very aggressive way, like they've seen this antigen before. Um, so that's pretty important to note. Um, so the mechanism behind it, this is the mechanism for how inflammation is going to kill almost anything here. So cytokine mediated, the cytokine storm is going to uh, recruit neutrophils and raw and the neutrophils and the macrophages are actually going to release ROS, which is going to kill the tissues. Or the T cell mediated is going to be the T cells, so the cytotoxic T cells, the CD8s, binding and inducing apoptosis into those cells. So this is, this is what we're going to see in the type 4. So would this cause a cytokine storm, like specifically? Yes, this could cause a cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's other things that could also cause a cytokine storm? Yes, okay. yes, yeah. So a cytokine storm is a general term for when we have an over-increase in cytokines. That general over-increase in cytokines could be multiple cells activating to the same thing, all releasing cytokines saying, hey, we need to attract neutrophils or we need to attract macrophages to this area to deal with this. Um, so you see these in CD4 cells. CD8 cells, you won't see that. CD8 cells don't need cytokines because they're going to use perforin and granzymes to directly kill that cell. But when CD4 cells, you're going to see that because they're going to release cytokines to then, they're actually going to recruit the neutrophils and the macrophages. That's when you're going to get the cytokine storm. Thank you. No problem. Um, so other mechanisms, like we were saying, the same thing, cytokines produced by CD4 cells, uh, activating macrophages and inflammatory cells, so neutrophils, PMNs, and they're going to release those cytokines. Then we're going to have um, a huge issue of inflammation and just massive killing. And then CD8 cells are going to be directed killing of the target cell through perforins and granzymes. So perforins and granzymes, uh, it's the same thing. It's CD8 cells use it and NK cells use it to actually create holes in the cell membrane to induce apoptosis. And here, uh, this is a very, very good summary. It is a little wordy. So I would suggest taking this summary and kind of um, breaking it down to its bare essentials, you know, cutting out some words, maybe getting rid of some of the images and just getting it down to just bullet points that you can remember off the top of your head. Cytokines, uh, yeah, so cyto remember cytokines, you can break up cytokines into cytokines and chemokines. Chemokines are a type of cytokine that are going to recruit cells to the area cytokines, the overarching term is just a peptide that is going to tell a cell what to do. So either it's going to tell it to go into apoptosis or it's going to be a chemokine that's going to tell a cell, hey, come to this area. Um, and then in the in this example for this cytokine storm that we're talking about here for this inflammatory response, we have these cytokines that are technically chemokines um, that they are recruiting the macrophage neutrophil and the macrophage and neutrophil will release reactive oxygen species, which we know are very, very dangerous and can cause injury and apoptosis to cells. All right, so that is the end of that one. Make sure you go through it. I do have a few questions. Let me see if I can actually get to my questions. I also have a question. Sure. When you were talking about the class switching from um, to IgE and IgG, is, what what is it initially? Is it IgM that switches to those? Yes, yes. So remember, IgM is always the first one made. Um, so IgM is always going to be there. That's the that's the one that B cells can produce without any help. So it's the first one made. Once we have T cell interaction, so specifically Th2, if we have Th2 binding with that B cell, and you've got that CD40, CD40 ligand co-stimulation going on, remember, you need to remember all those co-stimulatory factors. So um, here we have the Th2 and the uh, B cell with CD40, CD40 ligand, that IgM will then be converted into an IgE. Make sense? 
I'm gonna go with that. All right. So here is our first question. Um, I have fixed it from last time. If anyone came to the afternoon one, uh, make sure do not answer it in the chat because I do not have the chat up, but um, enter into the poll everywhere. Um, it's all right there. Um, and it is active, so everyone can start answering. Did I get rid of that? Um, and there should not be a limit, so it should not close. And enjoy the questions. Also, I got all of my questions for this and for the practice test on Friday, all verified by Dr. Pross. And she actually helped add a few other questions to the ones that I had. So you are getting questions that are very indicative of the test and testing style because Dr. Pross is making some 80% of the questions for this first test. Hey, Daniel. Um, I have yes. a question about the reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like um, free radicals. Like, you know how like sometimes people will be like, oh, um, take a lot of antioxidants. Yes, that okay. is exactly, yeah, that's exactly. So uh, ROS are just free radical oxygen species. Um, that are roaming around. Um, antioxidants do work. The only one that is really the most effective is blueberries. Um, I, I remember when I was an undergrad 800 years ago, um, that's when the uh, that Brazilian berry came out, the acai or however you pronounce it. And um, they everyone thought, oh, this has way more antioxidants than, um, than blueberries. And then actually at USF, we were doing testing on it and it, it didn't. Um, but you'll get into it uh, in biochem. Um, how your cells actually get rid of those ROS and uh, reactive oxygen species. And, um, and then they actually do talk about some good antioxidants being blueberries as well as uh, citrus fruits. All right, Thank so we'll lock this, no problem. We'll lock this one up. So an infant boy is brought to a physician exhibiting dermatitis and endocrinopathy and weight loss. Upon further testing, it is discovered that this infant completely lacks regulatory T cells. Which gene mutation and disease would the physician suspect? So remember, if we're talking about T regs here, we are talking specifically about IPEX because that mutation would be in FOXP3. If we lack T regs, if it deals specifically with regulatory T cells, it is IPEX. Air is when we have a lack of negative selection. So that's kind of an overarching term. Lack of regulatory T cells deals directly with IPEX. Okay. All right, next question. This one's gonna be a little tough. Um, some of this information is gonna be on your next lecture, but you should be able to reason through it. We're going to throw a lot of questions at you on the test and I try to do more of them with a lot of information that you you've never heard of, but you should be able to get down to the bare bones of the information, the basics that you know and answer the questions. I'll give you all a little bit more time on this one. All right, I'm gonna lock this one up now. All right, so a child born with Bruton A gamma globulinemia, a disease that affects B cell development, which part of the lymph node with, whoop, that was wonderful typoing by me, will be most decreased due to this disease? So first of all, you've never heard of this disease. You should hear about it in your very next lecture on Thursday. You have not heard about it yet, but all you need to know is it affects B cell development. So it affects B cell development, where are the B cells in the germinal in the lymph node? They are in the germinal center. Remember, the medulla is going to be your um, your plasma cells. So those are fully differentiated B cells. We refer to those as plasma cells. We don't refer to them for B cell development. And your paracortex is going to be your T cells. All right. She mentioned this one in conversation. She did not uh, directly have it in her slide. 
And remember with her, you need to know the ones that she mentions. Also, for anyone wanting to know, I have not heard back from Dr. Anderson yet about um, being able to give you all these questions. Uh, so once I find out, I will let you all know. And if I'm allowed to, I will put them on and make them available. All right, I'm gonna lock this one up. All right, so clinical laboratories count all the following except, yes, TH1. There is no actual way to count that. Um, we do count the CD4, CD8, and CD3. Remember, CD3 is going to be um, the receptor next to the BCR or the TCR that's going to help send the signal from the outside through the cell membrane into the actual cell. So that's something that we glossed over very quickly. And you should already know CD4 and CD8 cells. She did mention this very briefly. Uh, in her lecture, make sure to go back and re-listen to those lectures. You can go on Panopto, you can do it, you can re-listen to them, and you can actually do it at a faster pace, which is pretty helpful. The last question just referred to like how much Th1 cells are inside Correct. the body, right? Correct, okay. yeah. only problem with poll everywhere is y'all can see how everyone else answers so it affects your judgment but this is what dr anderson suggested because this is what our med school and many other med schools use and he wants you all to get used to it rtas didn't do it we did kahoot which y'all might think is fun but it is terrible we give you all a few more seconds to finalize your answers All right, so which antibody is found on cell membranes of naive B cells and is not increased in serum following antigen exposure? So we need to make sure we know what they all do. IgA, mucosal. IgG is your, your most abundant. IgM is your first made, and this one goes through class switching. So IgD is found on the membranes. This is on the membranes of naive T cell or naive B cells. We said this in our lecture. Remember, this one does not do too much. It is just there and is used as a receptor. So it's not going to be increased after you come in contact with an antigen. If you come in contact with an antigen and it is T cell independent, so it's T cell independent, you will increase IgM only. If it is T cell dependent, depending on the scenario, you're either going to increase IgG, IgA, or IgE. Remember, we need T cells for class switching. Here is your next one. This one is not as fun. All right, I'm going to lock it up in a little bit. Seems like we haven't had that many more answers. Uh, so which of the following extracellular components correctly paired? You, Like I said, you have to know the co-stimulatory and which one does which. So B7 and, C and CD28 is correct. Please make sure you know that this co-stimulatory is going to release IL-2 and IL-2R, specifically the gene for IL-2R, the receptor, which is then going to allow us to go through clonal expansion. Uh, CD40 and CD40 ligand, that's for class switching, and make sure you know that, and then B7 and CTLA4 to stop 
the immune response. Make sure you also know which one is on which cell. It's very, very important to know that. There you go. It's also pretty important uh, as you're doing this one and as you do all these questions and the questions from the other TAs and our TA review questions on Fridays, make sure when you go through them on your own to study them, you're not just trying to find out which one is the correct answer. Um, make it a habit to go through and explain either writing it down or going through uh, with a study partner if you have one um, to go through and write down which ones are incorrect and why. Because if you go through that, even though that is an extra step, it's going to help you learn the information and kind of get you through the process of answering these questions a lot faster to figure out which what's the best way to answer these questions. Give you all a little bit more time. Doo -doo -doo. All right, I'll stop it now. Let me lock it. So this question is going to be um, pretty close to a lot of questions you might see. A 40-year-old man presents in the ER with vomiting, diarrhea, high fever, tachycardia, and confusion. He has very low blood pressure. His blood work shows a significant increase in CD4 positive T cells, which is the most likely cause of this symptom. So you see a lot of stuff on here. The big thing that should jump out at you is CD4 positive T cells. So that if you work back through your process, if you've made sheets, CD4 positive, what does that lead us to? CD4 positive we see with exogenous antigens. So then the question being, which of these can give us an exogenous antigen? Influenza, virus, so that's going to be endogenous, so that can't be it. Staphylococca, Staphylococca enterotoxin superantigen. You're going to see this exact same thing in your next uh, lecture. But Staphylococca, that's a bacteria. So we could see it there because that is exogenous. Epstein-Barr virus, that is endogenous because it is a virus, so we're not going to see it there. So influenza, Epstein-Barr, knocked out. Malaria. Malaria is actually a parasite, something you're going to go over in block three. Um, so we haven't talked about that, but we've kind of talked about how parasites have a different, parasites and helmets have a different response. So they're going to have an IgE and mast cell response, which means CD4 positive. The only time you're going to see that with an exogenous antigen being staph. So that's going to be our bacterial response. So it was staph. So make sure you can go through those processes in your head very quickly. Um, you don't want to be stuck too long in each question. You only have 70 minutes. Uh, if you can break those down, you know, as you read it, you read it, you see these key points, CD4. All right, CD4 means exogenous, okay? So exogenous means bacteria. Bam, there's my answer. That's the kind of process that you need to do on these questions. Could you elaborate really quick about why malaria was wrong? So malaria is a, uh, it's a parasite, it's a helmet. So it's not an extracellular bacteria. It is an extracellular antigen, but malaria specifically and helmets and parasites, they will not elicit a CD4 positive um, response. They're going to elicit an IgE and mast cell response because we did say it, it was a while ago, but we did mention that IgE works with helmets, parasites, and allergies. All right. Thanks, Ben. No problem. All right. Give y'all a little bit more time. All 
All right, let me lock this one up. All right, so a mature T cell in the right iliac lymph node has evaded central tolerance in the thymus and is reacting to self antigens. Which of the following mechanisms does not denote a mechanism to decrease the damage done by self reacting cells? So this one's kind of confusing. Um, make sure you are prepared for double negatives on your tests. They like to do a lot of not questions and a lot of which one does not do this. So you have to think about which ones do. So that's the process you want to go through here is you want to think about which ones will decrease the damage done by self-reacting cells. So energy uh, for co-stimulation, that will decrease the damage. Death receptors engaged, that will decrease the damage. And suppression by Tregs will also decrease the damage. So the only one that does not decrease the damage being plasma cells producing antibodies against self-reacting cells. That is not actually, that's not one of our mechanisms for peripheral tolerance. Um, so these three would be our mechanisms for peripheral tolerance. So make sure you can denote that. All right, I think we've done a question just like this already, but I wanted to throw this one back out there because. Um, could you re-explain why energy from co- stimulation would decrease the damage? Yes, so energy being uh, no stimulation. So we get energy through CTLA-4. Um, so that's gonna be our co-stimulatory through B7 and CTLA-4. So if we have a cell that is highly, highly reactive to self and we attach a cell onto it with CTLA-4 co-stimulation, that will stop that cell. Does that make sense? Can you repeat that last part one more time? Yeah, I'll try, like to that last phrase. I'll try to remember exactly what I said. So if we have a cell that's overreacting to self, so it's um, it can attack any cell, it sees any, if we have a T cell that sees any receptor and it's ready to attack and kill it, um, in order to stop it, if we have another cell, attach onto it with CTLA-4 and the B7 response, that interaction, that's a co-stimulatory uh, interaction, and that will actually induce energy onto that cell that's overreactive. So it'll stop oh, that cell from okay. doing yeah. Got it, okay, thanks. No problem. I feel like I don't have to do too much for this one. Um, we talked about this one a lot. Um, and yes, everyone got it right, or at least all the people that put in answers. Wish we could see how many people, that would be nice. Okay, and that is it for that one. So let's get back. Okay, um, so before I go or before I ask for any questions, um, I did have a lot of people emailing me or questioning me on um, how to make the study guides. Um, so I did a mock, mediocre, terribly done um, skeleton of a study guide while y'all were doing the questions. So I wanna make sure that y'all can see it. Um, it's gonna be hard to read, but essentially this is this is the kind of layout that I would do. So at the very top, I'd put hypersensitivity. And then if I needed any information on to explain to myself what hypersensitivity was, I would write it right here. Then I would draw a little arrow, type one. I'd put everything I need to know about type one. Type two, put everything I need to know. Type three, put everything I need to know. Type four, put everything I need to do. Now this is like really rough and um, done in a matter of three seconds. If you really, really like focus on how to create this, you can maximize how much space you have on the sheet and you can turn this entire chart into a section just over here, which leaves everything else over here for tolerance. You can put everything you need about central and peripheral tolerance, T and B cell tolerance here, and then everything you need here with everything else from that lecture. So you can very easily turn that one lecture into one sheet and just organize all of your thoughts onto that one sheet. Um, that's just an idea. Uh, like I said, I have a lot more uh, study sheets for block two that I'll be giving you all. For block one, I really don't have any. Um, we can kind of make one together for vaccines when Dr. Pross goes through the vaccine lecture. Um, I have to wait to see, because I have one for vaccines, but I have to wait to see what she lectures you all on um, to the extent of with vaccines, because I had Dr. Yugen for vaccines, so it would be a little different. Um, so at this point, I will open it up. Anyone have any questions, anything they'd like clarification on, anything like that? You're more than welcome to ask. Hey, Daniel, I have a good question. Mm -hmm. 
I've always seen Hashimoto's presented as hyper or hypothyroidism, but for the sake of this class, I should just yes. correlate it with hypothyroidism. Yeah, yeah, definitely correlate it with hypo. Um, you'll see it again in biochem, and you'll see it in, um, I think he mentions it in uh, genetics. You'll see it in, uh, in anatomy. You'll see it in pathology, uh, and you'll also see it in physio. You're going to see it in like every class between Graves and Hashim Hashimoto's. So for this class, make sure you just remember Hashimoto's being hypo and Graves being hyper. All right. So in the chat, would basing study sheet outlines on the lecture outline slides? Um, that's a good idea. Um, the problem with that, uh, Abigail, so is sometimes if you notice, Dr. Pross will put things a little out of order or will have something that she kind of references at the beginning and then explains it later on at the end. So um, you can do it that way. What I would suggest is go through it, kind of get a general idea of what your main points are. Once you get your main points, you know, write them on a sheet of paper and then find out which slides have that information and put that under each uh, bit. Um, sometimes it can work where you can kind of just flow through it, but it'll happen very annoyingly that you'll flow through it and then you'll get to, you know, you already wrote something down and you'll get to slide 17. It's like, oh, here's more of an explanation. It's like, could have added that on before, but so it, it all depends on how you want to, um, how you actually want to organize your thoughts. So Hone, can you explain the type three graph again slowly, please? The type three, oh, the type three graph. Okay, so the one in the actual slides. So the one in the slides is actually just showing you um, you have a whole bunch of in a normal situation. So the, the one, the graph isn't showing you the hypersensitivity. What it's actually doing is it's showing you um, in a normal situation. They're not hypersensitivity. It's showing you, you have, you have a whole bunch of free antigen and that free antigen will go down over time because we have antibodies binding to that antigen. So we have at the, at the front of it, we have free antigen, which is very high and then it goes down. And then you have over time, in that in a middle area, you have where you have a whole bunch of antigen and antibody bound together. As you use your antibodies and you can break down that antigen and get rid of it, then you'll have a whole bunch of free antibodies. So you have free antigen on this side, free antibodies here. They meet when they all bind. Type three hypersensitivity is where you're stuck in this low point where all the antigen and all the antibody are actually bound together and form those large complexes. Okay, Jillian, can you repeat what energy is? It's just when B cells do not respond. So energy is when anything doesn't respond. Um, so I kind of mentioned it, but I guess I didn't explain the thought process. So energy is just a combination of an, so the root for an being none, uh, like without, and then energy. So it's anything that is lacking any sort of stimulation. So you can have B cell energy um, when the B cell isn't responding uh, in central education and tolerance, or you can have T cell energy as well. T cell energy just being when you have a T cell that does not respond to self at all. So if it doesn't respond to self at all, then you're not gonna have any sort of response. All right, uh, Leah, did you have a question? You had your hand raised. Hi, I had a question about um, antigen presenting cells. Mm -hmm. So for, so MHC class one and two, those are antigen presenting mechanisms on B cells? So MHC class one mm -hmm. is a way for all nucleated cells to oh. present endogenous antigen. So an MHC is just a complex that we create in the endoplasmic reticulum, shuttle it out to the outside of the cell, and it's used as like a flag or a marker on mm -hmm. the cell saying, hey, I need to interact with a T cell. MHC class one is for endogenous. So we see it on every nucleated cell because that's any cell that can be infected by a virus. Then an MHC class two is only on APCs. So when we say APCs in this term, we're referring to macrophage, dendritic cells, and B cells. So those three cells have the ability to make the MHC class two in their endoplasmic reticulum and then shuttle it out to the membrane and mark it to then interact with CD4 cells, CD4 T cells. Uh, okay, thank you. That makes so much more sense. No problem. Then I think Jacob had his hand up next. 
Yeah. Sorry for all the questions, by the way. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Um, so one thing I noticed, like, I'm understanding a lot of the, you know, MHCs, all the different cells and receptors and everything. But then when it comes to, like, a question that you ask and there's just, like, all the answers are different diseases or viruses, like, I have trouble differentiating what's what if it doesn't have the name, like, virus in it. So, like, do you have any tips on recognizing what may have what mechanism? Um, yes. So that is more of a like a testing strategy thing rather than content knowledge. So what you have to be able to do and where a lot of people get trouble in this program is you go from like undergrad where the questions are a little bit more straightforward. They're one to two step questions to here where you get like three to four to five step questions where you have to go like from this point and in your brain go all the way over here to answer that point. Um, so instead of looking for the right answer try to look for the wrong ones and cancel the wrong ones out and then go to base knowledge so like all of these questions usually ask base knowledge um also i'm presenting you with stuff now on generic virus and bacterial names they won't do generic ones unless they've talked about talked about them in their lecture so like you probably won't see malaria specifically as one unless it has been mentioned in an actual lecture um so like in the next two lectures, you're going to get a lot more examples of bacteria and viruses and microbes that infect the human cell. And they will tell you this is this, this is that, this is this. They're not going to tell you that, you know, staph, the staphylococcal, so staph aureus, is going to activate CD4. Um, they're not going to tell you that. But you need to know because it's back. They're telling you this is a bacteria. Because it's a bacteria, it then links to CD4 which then links to this and links to the next thing and links to the next thing. So you need to be able to connect those dots. Um, but in reference to like the specific viruses and bacteria, they will tell you um, which ones in their lectures. They're never going to assume kind of like I did. Um, but make sure you take note of anyone that they mention. Like if they mention it in passing, then that's fair game for you to know that it is a exogenous or endogenous antigen. Make sense? Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think for me, I was just a little confused and thrown off with one of those questions. But yeah. as long as they express what it is, whether it's a bacteria or virus, like I feel comfortable getting through that. So thank you. They'll, no problem. They'll do that in the lecture. They might not necessarily do that in the question stem, um, but they'll do it in the lecture for ones that they want you to know. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Uh, no problem. Um, and then I think Alexis was the next person to have her hand up. This is kind of more of a random question, but I know you were mentioning that we'll have other professors later on. Um, we've only had Dr. Cross primarily. Is she like the main professor or it'll change for each? It changes for each block. Um, okay. For this, uh, for this class, it changes for each specialty. Um, so normally, um, the past few years, it's the, the immunology section of this is Dr. Pross and Dr. Yugen. Um, they're like the two heads for immunology. Then once you get through immunology, you get to Dr. Anderson, who is bacteriology. He does all the bacteria. And then you'll do Dr. Tang for viruses, because each one of them have their own specialty. And then you'll do Dr. Seifang for um, parasites. Um, and each one of them, so if they lecture, they're the ones making the questions. So each test will have different question styles as well. And you'll see that in biochem and it's pretty much it because i know there's two lecturers in anatomy but they ask very similar style questions and then also um dr blank is the only person who does genetics so um, okay thank you no problem um elizabeth is you'll know, indicate this type of styles uh I'm guessing you want me to indicate the type of styles each prefer. I was asking if you do, like for instance, like this professor is very direct with their questions or this one, those kind of tidbits. I was curious if you. Um, so right now, um, the questions that you're seeing that I'm giving you are all approved by Dr. Pross. I made sure to get them approved by her before I gave them to y'all. So these are all very indicative of Dr. Pross questions. Um, like I've said before with her, make sure you pay attention to the things that she says. 
Also, this is the only course, I know Dr. Anderson stressed it when he was discussing it with all the other professors, this is the only course that you have a dedicated teacher review session before your test. So the Thursday directly before your test, you have a dedicated review question that you actually get to directly ask the teachers questions about the test coming up on the very next day. And they'll kind of talk about their styles. Um, this is very Dr. Pross. Uh, Dr. Anderson is very um, vignette style, where it's you have to say what type of microorganism this is, or um, what he'll give you some examples of it, or he'll give you the microorganism and you have to give examples of it, some differentiating factors. He might give you symptoms. And with those symptoms, then you have to determine a line of treatment kind of thing. Um, so he's a little bit more uh, dichotomous key, kind of. Uh, Dr. Seifeng is very direct, and um, Dr. Tang is almost the exact same as Dr. Frost when it comes to it. So there's not going to be that much changing in this course uh, between question styles. It'll go from these questions that you see uh, with Dr. Frost that are like five-step questions and then um, it'll go to dichotomous key ones where it's just differentiating factors between them that you have to know. And then it'll go back to five step and then back to differentiating factors. Thank you. No problem. Does anyone else have any other questions? All right, then I will probably sign off. Um, hopefully you all have a good rest of your Wednesday. Um, I will be at the nighttime review again. Um, like I will be every Wednesday. It should be the exact same. I know some of y'all came back again uh, for the nighttime review. You're more than welcome to. Um, and like always, you're always more than welcome to just email me and ask me any questions that you might have separately. And then uh, for anyone that is in person, I will be there on Friday in person covered in a mask and PPE. Uh, doing our review session. So um, thank you all. And just like always, if you have any questions, just reach out. One question. Yes. Um, so you said that basically T cells see peptides, B cells see macromolecules. Is that what initiates what's going to respond? Is whether you're going to get a T cell responding or a B cell responding, is it it's so, seeing peptides or macromolecules or what initiates a T-cell versus a B-cell response? So that's that's going to be the difference between our T-cell dependent and our T-cell independent. Um, so the different type of macromolecule is going to initiate whether or not we get class switching or not. So if it is a peptide, then it will allow for T-cell interaction, which will give us class switching, which means we can have different types of immune globulin being made from the B-cell. If it's not a peptide, like you're saying, if it's another macromolecule, if it's a lipid, a nucleic acid, a carbohydrate, um, and a lot of them are carbohydrates, then we're just going to get a B cell. So if it's only a B cell reacting, that's going to give us just IgM. We won't get class switching. So that's the differentiating factor, whether or not it's a T cell dependent reaction, which needs peptides, or T cell independent, which uses anything other than a peptide. Okay. Make sense? Yes. So okay. I could I could have just a B cell re, um, reacting, which is probably going to be very very few times, because of the limited things that B cells can respond to, or I'm going to have. It would be more often than not that you'll actually only have a B cell reacting, sadly. Okay. Um, and and the reason for that being that that's that's why we get sick more often than not, because sometimes we're only getting that B cell reaction. If you can get that T cell reaction and you can get the isotype switching, you're going to get healed. You're going to deal with it a lot faster. Got it. Yeah. So, um, and you'll see that when we get, I know it stinks because like we're like two lectures away from it, but when we get to vaccines, you'll see that, that most of our vaccines actually only allow for B cell interaction. They don't, we aren't able to create vaccines yet that are all T cell, inter, T cell dependent. Okay. Um, so, but that is a good way to think yeah, about it. Bring in the CD4s, the CD8s, and all of that. So, yes. Yep. Thank you. That's no what problem. I needed. No problem. Okay. So, are the review sessions in person only? Uh, they will be both. So, Melissa, they will be both in person and um, on Teams. Uh, we're going to do it just like the lecture that Dr. Prost did yesterday. Um, I'm not sure yet how smoothly it'll go because um, it'll be our first time doing it in person 
cannot. So we'll find out. Hopefully it runs pretty smoothly. Um, but you will, all of the TAs will be there. Um, so we'll all be able to answer your questions individually. And we're going to do it the exact same way where we go through the, um, when we go through each question and we can go through an explanation. If you have any questions on it, we can explain it. Um, I would say again, um, the practice test will be open between 11 and 145. Make sure as many of you can answer all the questions. Um, treat it like an actual practice test. Treat it like you are preparing yourself to take a test in person or on grounds or at home like you would the actual exam. So, you know, sit down, you know, unplug headphones, sit there, really just focus on it and try to try to do it like you're actually doing a test. So that's the that's the biggest thing I can say. So Friday Review is on ground. Uh, I believe it is. Yeah, I think it's limited. And I think this week is group A. And I think next week will be group B and then it'll keep alternating. Um, yeah. And I mean, you're not you're not missing that that much difference between um, in person and online. Uh, if you're in person this week, you get to see all of us sit there with our masks on. Um, and uh, we will also try to make sure that any question that's asked in person is repeated online so the online people can hear it. Um, that's that's pretty much it. So any other questions? All right, then I will see, I'll probably see you all in the chat uh, tomorrow and some of you on Friday. Have a good rest of your week if I do not see you.